is there an overall broader principle that says blockchain technology is probably a great way to advance and enhance privacy in Europe, but for the fact that you may not be able to comply with the right to be forgotten. So shouldn't there be some carve out, some exception to recognize the overall advantages of blockchain in a privacy sanctifying world? Uh, with, and then figure out uh, whether or not there are workarounds on the right to be forgotten issue there. So that was sort of the third rail issue for us. Is it, is it dead in the water because it can't satisfy the right to be forgotten? So I mean, uh, just a quick answer to that. Uh, my first assignment at LGO was actually I created GDPR policy. And um, so I had to basically learn about you know, what this is and how it could impact this business that I, you know, just joined and then really just try to learn about. Um, but anyways, that's something that, you know, complying with AML and KYC obligations, we have to sort of ask our vendors, okay, so we're giving you this information, like our client's passport ID, etc. How are we going to be sure that once we release that to you, that, you know, that you're erasing it within 14 days like you're telling us we are. So that's been something that we've thought about and then um, from the blockchain aspect, I'm probably not best at describing it, but how we do, we have a, a centralized order book where, you know, it's centralized for efficiency reasons, and then on-chain, after orders are matched, we have the you know, transactions matched and put on the Bitcoin blockchain, so that has no PII, so we think that's compliant and that there's no customer information that's saved in this immutable, you know, sort of way. So. I'd like to know, uh, we, our journal received a submission recently that covers, addresses the French government's kind of, sorry, uh, response uh, to the situation, right, where there might be not so much coherence between blockchain and GDPR, and uh, I'm happy to say that there is some kind of, you know, some sandboxing, uh, depends on the jurisdiction, but there are efforts to kind of address this issue, because enough people realize that. Uh, there is some incompatibility, so it's not like people are sticking their heads in the sand. Uh, it is being worked on. Um, coming from an antitrust background, I was a lawyer for about four or five years, which is a uh, one thing's for sure. Uh, it behooves a lot of uh, a lot of national governments to really work on these issues because, again, no one wants to be left behind. So I think there are enough kind of voices of reason in hopefully embedded in different agencies of different national governments to understand that. It's something they need to work on with uh, hopefully some polycentric uh, cooperation. By that I mean, you know, not just consulting government people, but also uh, civil society, startups, practitioners, so forth. I think that's a, it's a pretty much become more of an accepted model rather than just calling the shots from above. So hopefully we see more of that. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm Christopher. I'm an attorney in Brooklyn Law School. Uh, I'm a practitioner from Trinidad Tobago. And it's recently that I'm 